That, <clears throat> Hassani, thank you. Thank you so much. I, I didn't know, I didn't know y'all were here. That is, <laughs> I, can I ask you a real quick question? So he, did he perform the ceremony? Yes. Yeah, that's amazing. Did he, did he get emotional? Yes. Oh, I, yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet he was crying like a baby. I would be. What a great story. Thank you so much. What, I mean, what a great story. Thank you. Hassani, thank you for what you and Danielle are doing. Whew. Oh, my goodness. All right. Oh. So uh, our next speaker um, is uh, certainly well-known. Uh, the abduction of Elizabeth Smart was one of the most followed child abduction cases of our time. And through this traumatic experience, Elizabeth has become an advocate for change related to child abduction, recovery programs, and national legislation. As the founder of the Elizabeth Smart Foundation, Elizabeth has also helped promote uh, National Amber Alert, the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act, and other safety legislation to prevent abductions. Her story has been well chronicled. In fact, many of you have probably seen over the last month an A&E documentary and a Lifetime movie, as well as her autobiography, My Story. She is married with two children, and Elizabeth's example is a daily demonstration that there really is life after a tragic event. This is Good Morning America. This is Nightline. You're watching WISN 12. The abduction of Elizabeth Smart. A search for 14-year-old Elizabeth Smart has now gone nationwide. She was kidnapped from her bedroom in Salt Lake City. Please say the first 48 hours in a missing person's case are the most crucial. Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Smart. What happened to Elizabeth Smart? Will you please join me in welcoming Miss Elizabeth Smart? Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It really is such a pleasure to be with you. As was mentioned, this last month has been a very busy one. And as I was going around in New York, um, doing it felt like interview after interview after interview. One of the most commonly asked questions was, have you forgiven your captors? And yes, I have, but not because it will make any difference to them, because it won't. My captors, they don't care. <laughs> they could care less if I have forgiven them. They do, they, I highly doubt either one of them feels sorry for what they've done. I highly doubt that what has happened to them, going to prison, going to jail, has truly changed them. Perhaps it has, I hope it has but I seriously doubt it. Um, my forgiveness for them will not affect their life, will not affect who they are and what they've done, but I know that it affects me. And the morning after I was rescued, my mom gave me the best piece of advice I've ever been given. She said, Elizabeth, what these people have done to you is terrible. And there aren't words strong to describe how, how wicked and evil they are. They have stolen nine months of your life away from you that you will never get back. But the best punishment you could ever give them is to be happy, is to move forward with your life, to do all the things that you want to do because by feeling sorry for yourself, by holding on to the past, by reliving in it, that's only allowing them to steal more of your life away from you. And they don't deserve that. They don't deserve a single second more. So you need to be happy and you need to move on with your life. And at first as she said that, I thought, whoa, why, why am I going to feel sorry for myself? Why would I be upset? I'm home. I have my family back. I have my friends back. I have my life back. I, everything that was taken away <laughs> is now back. And it's going to be fine. I'm just going to pick right up where I left off. Well. It didn't quite happen just like that. I had no idea how many people all of a sudden knew my name. I mean, I remember going out and going to the grocery store with my mom and having people approach us 
all the time. And, and even when they'd approach us, I don't know if they couldn't, didn't think it was me or thought I couldn't hear, but I'd literally be standing right next to my mom and they'd be like, oh, we're so glad Elizabeth is back safe and is she doing okay? And I was sitting there thinking, I'm right here, like, really? <laughs> and um, it was just such a huge adjustment to have so many people all of a sudden know who I was because before I was kidnapped, I was very much a wallflower. I was very much just kind of happy to blend in, to not be noticed. Um, I, had a, I had the best childhood anyone could ask for. I had the best family anyone could ask for. And all of a sudden I was home and all these people knew who I was and thought they knew what had happened to me. And, and it was a huge adjustment and I couldn't believe it. And then I remember going back to school and as I'd walk down the hallways, people would yell out my name just to see if I would turn, to see if it was really me. And I remember being shocked and surprised. And I remember as I started to move on in my life, there would be experiences that would happen and it would remind me of things that had happened. I remember sitting in, in uh, Sunday school one day where I had a very well-meaning, well-meaning teacher. And she was talking to the class, talking about how important marriage was and, and um, talk, asking everyone what kind of person they'd like to marry. And I remember, you know, people raising their hands saying, well, I want the person that I marry to be kind. I want the person, you know, to have, you know, faith in God. I want them to be this. I want them to be that. And then a boy raised his hand and he said, well, I want my wife to be a virgin. And I remember just sitting there thinking, well, that takes me right out of the running. Not that I was vying for that position in my life anyways, not with him. But when he said that, that just immediately triggered the thought that will never be me. What if lots of people think that? What if I never get married because someone doesn't want to marry someone who's been raped? Being raped was... I, the day that it happened, I, he'd broken into my home, he'd taken me out my back door, taken me up into the mountains behind my home, and almost the first thing he did when he brought me into camp was he had his wife come out, and he had her change me, and she'd try to sponge bathe me, um, and then she stepped away, and he came in, and that's when he told me that I was now his wife, and um, that it was now time to consummate our marriage. Well, as a 14-year-old girl, I wasn't unintelligent, but I certainly, <sighs> I'd heard that word consummate before, but I'd never heard it in that context. And I remember, I remember just stopping and thinking, wait a second. And I had this thought of what he could possibly mean. I had it come to my mind. I remember thinking, no, that's not possible. One human being couldn't possibly do that to another one. No one's that evil. And I quickly found out that yes, as a matter of fact, there are people out there that are that evil. I remember him forcing me on the ground and raping me. And when he got up, he, he smiled, turned around and walked out of the tent like it wasn't a big deal. And that day as I sat in class, um, listening to people say things that they looked for in their spouse, saying that, I remember just thinking, well, that's, that's against me. That's something that's been taken away from me that I'll never be able to get back. And I remember feeling, feeling terrible about that. I remember when my case finally came to court. It was eight years later. It took eight years before I could finally go to trial. And um, in the long run, looking back, it should not have taken that long. But at the same time, it did allow me time to go to high school, go on to college. I spent um, a semester abroad in London studying art and music. Um, it, I had gone to France. I was currently at the time living in France, serving a Mormon mission. 
And so in the long run, it did allow me time to move on with my life. But that being said, I remember sitting in the courtroom listening to my life, what felt like being torn apart and feeling like my life was now compiled to a list of facts. I remember sitting up on the testimony stand, on the witness stand, talking about the worst, the worst time of my entire life. And as I sat up on that witness stand, talking about everything that had happened to me, I, I remembered being taken to California, Southern California for the winter, where initially he had found this dry riverbed. It looked like, it looked like the fire swamp out of Princess Bride, to give you a point of reference so you can imagine it. That's what it looked like. And I remember just sitting in this camp day after day until finally one day he came back and he said, it's time. I... I'm going to go out, and he didn't say kidnap, but he said, he's like, I'm, I'm going to go out, and I'm going to get another wife, because just his real wife, Wanda Barzi, wasn't enough. I wasn't enough. He had this whole plan how he was going to go out and kidnap seven young girls. I was just the first. And he said he had found the next girl who's going to kidnap, and he started talking about her. Her parents had been divorced. He had found her, actually, through church. And um, he had never even seen her. But his parents, her parents, not his parents, her parents had befriended him and tried to, you know, welcome him and take him in. And they had fed him dinner at their house. And while he'd been at their house, he'd seen a picture of a young girl sitting on the piano. And she looked like she was about 12 years old. So he started to ask questions, found out that, the girl was the wife's daughter from a prior marriage and that she spent every other weekend and Wednesdays with them. And so he, he said, oh, that must, you know, that must be nice for you and continued on. And then that night he came back to this hidden camp in the fire swamp and he started talking about her. And then he said, I'm going to go out and I'm going to kidnap her. And he had counted up the days to make sure that she would be there on that weekend. And I remember that weekend came and he left. And the whole time that he was gone, I was terrified. I was terrified that he would succeed. And what if, what if he brought her back and he did the same things to her that he did to me? Would I just stand aside and let that happen? Or would I stand up with her? What would I do? How could I stop him? I couldn't stop him from doing what he did to me. But maybe if he succeeded, she and I could team together and we could escape. Maybe somehow something good would happen. And I remember when he got back, I was so relieved. I was so happy that he hadn't kidnapped her. But at the same time, there was a small part of me that didn't want her, him to be successful, but wanted a friend, wanted someone that I could turn to, someone that would be sympathetic to me, someone that would know exactly what I was going through because <laughs> my two captors certainly didn't. If any of you watched the TV movie, you certainly know that, and you certainly would know that Wanda Barzi was just as bad as he was, if not worse. <sighs> I remember as I sat on that stand, I'm thinking of those experiences. And I remember, I remember not long after he had tried to kidnap this other young girl, he, he became worried that people would find out where we were. And so he moved me to a higher camp, a hidden camp up on the mountainside. And it was so hard to get there. It was, I mean, I, you, it was almost impossible to get there. It was very, very difficult to get there. And I remember during that time, um, well, actually, when he decided that we were going to go out and find a new place for him to hide, hide me, I remember hiking up there, and there, was, there were these huge boulders on the side of the mountain, and I remember there was a crevice underneath one of them, and so he told me to crawl under there and see what was under there. Well... I did, and I remember at first I saw a pair of shoes, and that seemed kind of weird that 
there'd be a pair of shoes so far away, isolated up on the side of this mountain underneath this boulder, and then I found a belt, and then I crawled in a little deeper, and then I found some magazines. And I thought, well, that was really crazy. And I remember flipping them open, and it was full of pornography. And I remember just crawling out of there as fast as I could because even, even though I was, I had been so abused for, at that time, what, it was six months, I'd been so abused for six months already that was still extremely shocking to me. And I remember, he said, well, why did you come out? Why, why are you out of here? And I said, oh, well, there's just, there's a magazine under there. And as soon as he heard the word magazine, I remember he just shot under there and he pulled it out and he brought it out and he started looking at it and he was holding on to it like it was made out of solid gold. And then I remember every time after he'd look at that magazine, he'd start looking at me and whatever he looked at in the magazine he wanted to do to me. And every time he looked at that magazine, it always made my life so much worse. And during those weeks and months that I was up at this upper hidden camp, he and... Wanda Barzi, they would get in these terrible fights. They were, they were explosive. I, I, there's not even, it's, it's hard even to describe them, but they would just, she would get so mad at him. She would be screaming and yelling at him at the top of her, at the top of her lungs, which you would kind of think someone would overhear them yelling, but Nobody ever did, or if they did, they didn't do anything. And he'd yell back at her, and then she'd yell back at him. And then after she'd get to like this apex of yelling, he'd come back to her. And he was very, he was very smart in how he manipulated people. He found that the best way to manipulate people was through religion. And I think you also have to kind of take a step back and look at that period of time. I was kidnapped in 2002, June of 2002. 9-11 had just happened. So people were, I'd say, extra sensitive. And any time anyone questioned him about anything, why he dressed the way he dressed, or why he did the things he did, he always said, well, this is part of my religion. And that would immediately shut down any and all questioning. So he's very, he's very good at manipulating everyone around him. And he had done it for so long that he just found it really was the best tool in how to manipulate people. And he did it so long, it became more than just an act. It kind of became who he was because it was so easy to get away with what he wanted. So when Wanda Barzi would stand there just yelling at him, he'd come back and he'd say, of course, they didn't call each other Wanda or Brian. It was Hepzibah and Emmanuel. And he'd come to her, and he, well, he'd turn to her, and he'd say, Hepzibah, my delight is in thee, because that's what that name Hepzibah means, is my delight is in thee. And he'd say, this burden that I carry is so heavy, and, and God understands it, and he knows how you have suffered. He knows the, the hardship and the pains that you've been through, and you are so beloved among women. There is a throne waiting for you on the right-hand side of God, and you, know, you, are, you are best friends with Mary, the mother of Christ, and all of these things that you have suffered you will be rewarded for, and you are the mother of Zion. He'd go on and on and on, and honestly, it was revolting listening to him talk to her. I mean, I, I can't do it justice. I can repeat the words, but I will never be able to fully impersonate him, nor would I actually want to, because it's that bad. In fact, during the filming of the movie of the TV movie I was on set and um, Skeet Ulrich who played Brian David Mitchell he asked me well do you have any comments what would you tell me and I said well you're doing a great job already I already kind of don't like you because you just creep me out <laughs> but that aside if you could get me to throw up then you know you're on the right track and actually I didn't ever throw up but I remember when I finally watched the final version before it was ever released on TV, I remembered the whole time just thinking, 
I could just close my laptop. I could just walk away. I don't actually have to watch this right now. And then I think, no, if I close it, I'll never finish watching it. I have to finish watching it. Um, and I don't know how all of you feel, but I hate hearing my voice. I always think, do I really sound like that? Did I really say that? Or when I see myself on TV, I'm like, oh, please, please, please change the channel. I do not want to watch that. Well, um, during the TV movie, I narrate it. So I come on screen and you hear my voice throughout the TV movie. And just to show you how much I <laughs> did not, how hard it was to watch, I would feel relieved when I'd see myself. I'd be like, okay, I can breathe again. Life can continue. Well, that's what it really was like while I was kidnapped. I mean, it was so bad. Just the way he was just so manipulative and so oily, so greasy when he'd come back to her and he'd be like, oh, you've gone through so much and you have this throne waiting for you. And, and anyways, there was this day that they had had probably the biggest fight to date. And I remember just trying to be as small as I could, hiding in the corner of the tent, just hoping that they could just leave me out of it, that they could just not notice me. That's what I wanted. And this fight, it just escalated and escalated. And instead of turning to her with his usual, well, rhetoric, he got up and he put his handmade hat on and picked up his money bag and he left the hidden campsite. And I remember Wanda Barzi just yelling at him and yelling at him, telling him that he couldn't leave her. He couldn't turn his back on her, the mother of Zion. And he walked off down the mountainside. And I remember just thinking, what is going to happen? Well, we'd already been a day without real food. We had very little water left. And I thought, well, definitely, definitely he'll come back tomorrow. And the next day came. And by that day, we were, we were out of water. We were out of food. We didn't have anything left. And he didn't come back. And I remember the next day came. And I was feeling pretty weak. I mean, food was, food was already a... <laughs> Well, it was very scarce. It wasn't something that was just lying around. There never was just tons of food. And whenever I did eat, it was what they gave me when they gave it to me. I couldn't just go and take it. And the one time, really, that they let me, I remember he, someone had thrown away half of a burrito, and he brought it back for Wanda Barzi and I to share. And she cut it in half and she told me to pick which side. And one side, there was one side that had one extra fold of tortilla, just one extra fold of tortilla. And I chose that side and she got so angry at me. She said I was so selfish and I was so greedy because I took the side with the extra piece of tortilla. I mean, food was scarce. Anyways, um, so that third day came, there was no food. I remember seeing clouds overhead and it started to rain. So she ran outside and she told me to come quickly and we, we spread a big tarp and we caught the rainwater and we tried to pour it into the gallon jugs that we had so that we could keep it so at least we'd have something to drink. Well, we drank the water and the next day came and there's, he still didn't come back. All we had was water and after a couple of days, it kind of looked like, I don't know, it kind of looked like stuff was growing in the water, but we kept on drinking it because that's all that there was. I remember feeling like I couldn't even sit up because I'd just get lightheaded and dizzy and I'd just lie down. And I remember it was about a week had gone by. And at that point, I, I couldn't even stand up. I just remember lying on the ground with my little blanket, just feeling like this is it. This is the end. I'm going to die now. I hope that, <laughs> I hope I can look back on this and see some humor in it that, you know, it's been seven months. I didn't die of seven no months after being kidnapped and, and chained up and, and raped and abused. I didn't die of all those things. I survived all that. But the thing that killed me was starvation. I hope I can see humor in that one day. And um, I remember as I was sitting there praying, 
because I was trying to, well, I was trying to make, find my peace, make my peace with the world and, and prepare myself for what lay ahead um, because I really did feel like I was going to die at that point in time. And I remember as I lay there praying, I had the thought that really up until the point that I had been kidnapped, I had been hugely blessed. I had a wonderful family. I had a wonderful home. I had a wonderful, wonderful childhood. And that was 14 and a half years of, of a wonderful life. And 14 and a half years, what is that? My math's not that good. 14 times 12 plus 6, whatever number that is. Um, compared to seven really terrible, awful months. Well, the majority of my life had been pretty wonderful. So in reality, I had a lot to be thankful for. And so I started to think of all the things that I was thankful for. And then far off in the distance, I heard a voice. And it was singing hymns. But it certainly was not angelic in any way, actually. It was off-key and sloppy. And I remember the voice getting louder and louder. If only it had been the heavenly, heavenly choirs of angels singing. <laughs> that probably would have been great. <laughs> but a few minutes later, into the camp walks Brian David Mitchell. And he comes back in like he is the conquering hero. He throws open the tarps on the tarp tent that he had built. And he just sort of plops down next to Wanda Barzi and myself. And in his hands are these bags full of KFC that, unbeknownst to us, well, he quickly informed us that they had been about to throw out, but he had asked them if he could have them instead, and so they gave them to him. And I remember being so hungry, and he started to talk of all of all of the things he had experienced and how difficult he was. And I was just sitting there thinking, really? Really? You tell me how hard prison was while you laid in bed every day, had three meals every day, had a hot shower every day? Yeah, that must have been torture for you. Anyways, I was thinking all those things. I didn't say it. <laughs> um, and then he finally said, okay, now you can eat. And I remember thinking, well, I'm going to eat all this food. I think I only could take a few mouthfuls because my stomach had shrunk so much. I remember all those memories, the memories of almost starving and being chained up and being raped and, and him going after these other young girls to kidnap. All those memories came back to me when I was on the witness stand. But I also remembered what my mom had told me, that what this man had done to me was terrible, and that he'd stolen nine months of my life that I'd never get back, but the best punishment I could ever give him was to be happy, was to move forward with my life. And I'd always listened to my mom's advice. I'd always tried to follow it. I <laughs> fall short of it probably far too often. But especially that day, I thought about it, and I thought about what I felt then. And I remember leading up to the trial, I was actually... I was actually very nervous to see my captors again. I hadn't seen them in person since the day I was rescued. And I didn't know how I was going to react. I remember sitting in the front row behind the prosecuting team. And they brought Brian Mitchell into the room. And he still had his long beard and his long hair. But he was shackled with his hands around his waist and his feet, and there were two guards on either side of him escorting him into the courtroom. And I realized in that moment that I had followed my mom's advice, that I didn't need to be scared of what he would make me feel because I realized that he had no power over me anymore. And I realized that forgiveness is not for the other person, it's for yourself at least in my case. I guess I can't speak for anyone else. I can only share what I've learned. And what I've learned is that forgiveness is for you. Because had I held on to my pain, had I held on to my anger, had I held on to all of the terrible, horrible things that these people did to me, that they almost killed me, that they had taken away, they abruptly put an end to my childhood. They had done terrible, terrible things to me. I could let go of that. 
I realized that if I said I forgive you to them, they wouldn't matter to them. They will continue on with their life. Either way, whether I say it or not, they don't care. It will not make a difference to them, but it will make a difference to me. If I hold on to that hate, if I hold on to that anger, that means that a part of my soul will always be angry, will always be in pain, will always feel that negativity into my life. And that means that if you look at it mathematically, which I'm not a mathematical kind of person, that's always been my worst subject, followed closely by science, but <laughs> um, I guess it kind of helps me to explain how I feel crazy enough by using percentages. So if a percentage of me was always angry, held on to that, that means a percent of me would always, you know, would always be angry. So let's just say 10%. 10% of me would always be angry, would always feel pain, would always be holding on to the past. Well, that means only 90% of me could feel happiness, could feel love, could feel joy. And as I've moved on with my life, that means only 90% of me would be able to love my husband. That means only 90% of me would be there for my kids. I, I have two now. Uh, I've got a two and a half year old daughter named Chloe and I've got a seven month old son named James. That means that only 90% of me would be there for them. And I can't afford to only be there for them 90%. I can't afford to only love my husband 90%. Call me selfish, but I want to be there for my kids 100%. I want to be there for my husband 100%. I want to love my husband 100%. And I can't do that if I held on to my pain and my anger. And I think it is a great, it's a, it's a miracle that I was rescued when I was 15, that it was almost a decade before I got married. I think there were many things that helped me to get to where I was. I think if I came back to a forced arranged marriage where my future husband was old enough to be my dad or maybe my grandpa, yeah, I think I would have still some major issues with it. But I didn't go back to that. I came back to a loving family. I came back to a supportive community. I came back to friends who were there for me. I came back to being able to go back and to take sort of those normal steps into getting into a relationship, you know, going to high school, holding a boy's hand for the first time. Well, actually, let's even start before that. Saying hi to a boy. Even boys I went with to school since I was in kindergarten, finally being able to say hi to them you know, and then having a conversation, and then becoming friends, and you know, the rest of it. Um, that's what I came back to. So I did have an experience of, of healing, and, but for me, that day in court, seeing them, I knew that I'd let go of it. I knew that, that I didn't need to worry about any power that they had over me because they didn't have any more, any more. I knew that I was, I was, I knew that I had forgiven them and that I had let go, wow, well, I'd let go, I had let go of the past. I had moved on with my life and that I was living my life as full as I possibly could. And I remember how empowering that felt to me on the last day of the trial, when the verdict came in that he was found guilty, I remember the judge looking at me and asking me if I had anything to say to him. And to be truthful, I don't exactly remember <laughs> what I said, but I do remember just standing up and saying that he had no further hold on me that he never would and that I was going to live a wonderful life. And if I didn't say that in words, I certainly thought that. <laughs> and I just, I remember feeling the same way as I've moved forward in every major life decision that I, I'm so happy that I am able to live in this moment and look into my future and be in it 100%. And I feel so blessed and so lucky that, this is going to sound crazy, but that I was kidnapped and I was abused under the circumstances 
that I was because I meet so many other survivors on almost a daily basis where their stories, everyone's story is different and everyone has a story. I mean, whether it's kidnapping and abuse or whether it's health or whether it's financial or whether it's marriage, whatever it is, everyone has a story. And many of the stories that I do hear do involve um, rape and sexual violence and abuse. And I'm so thankful that I was kidnapped and abused and raped by a stranger because so many people out there, the majority of abuse that takes place comes from a family member or someone that you know. And how incredibly difficult would that be to go back home and face that person every day or know that your family was forever divided because half of your family can't believe that you know, your, your father or your uncle or your brother, whoever it was, could ever possibly do that and the other half of your family is on your side. Or I, I just can't imagine how difficult that would be. So I feel so lucky and so blessed that my kidnapping, my abduction, the abuse that I happened to meet was by a stranger because I don't know that I could forgive if it was a family member. And even, even, even as I've sat here explaining percentages and how I wouldn't be able to live my life 100%, I can't imagine the betrayal I would feel if it was a family member. And so I am so grateful for what has happened to me that it came from someone that I didn't know from someone that I didn't love, from someone that I'm not related to. I feel like whatever this case is, whatever the situation is, there is always something to be grateful for and being grateful, finding gratitude is what will help you to move on. I remember every time I thought my situation couldn't get worse, it somehow always did. So I got to a point where instead of thinking this is the worst it can get, whenever something would happen, I'd start thinking, okay, what can make this worse? And I'd start thinking of it that way. And then I'd think, okay, well, it could be raining. That might make it worse. Or, um, you know, I could be, I don't know, locked and chained up inside a dark cave where I never saw sunlight. I'd think of these things. And then when those things didn't happen, I found something to be grateful for. And that's what helped me get through every day. And I found that's always served me well as I've moved on and as I've faced my other trials and I've faced my other, well, we all have them. No one's perfect. No one's life is perfect. Whatever I've faced, I've always found that that has helped me to be grateful for something and in the long run be able to let go of whatever it is that has happened to me. And so I would just say that you can try to use that tactic as well, find the worst and then be grateful when it doesn't happen. But I would also say that life is so worthwhile and no matter what has happened to you, no matter what your background is, no matter what your past is, each of us deserve to be happy. Each one of us is a son or a daughter of God and as such, I feel and truly believe that he wants each and every one of us to be happy and that bad things do happen, but that doesn't mean that they need to define us or to destroy our life. It's so easy to get caught in a pit feeling sorry for yourself, but I just have to go back to what my mom said. She said, don't let these people steal another second of your life. You need to be happy and move forward. And I don't think that she meant you'll never have another bad day. I don't think she meant that um, life is just going to be easy now. You just make up your mind and everything's good and great and that's it. I don't think she meant that at all. I think she knew that I would have hard times. I think she knew that I would have bad days and good days and there would be times where I'd feel angry and upset but I think that she meant that it's okay to feel these feelings, it's okay to be angry, it's okay to be mad, it's okay to feel pain, but make sure that that is not your end goal. Make sure that happiness is your end goal. And I've loved so much as what, uh, what was just said earlier, that, that forgiveness is not your end goal. Forgiveness is the pathway to your end goal, which is happiness and, and freedom from your past and, and moving forward. So I always say, we have things that happen to us, and yes, they shape us, they mold us, but they don't have to define us because in the end, 
What defines you is how you react, are the decisions that you make. So I hope that whatever you're faced with, whatever you deal with, you just remember that you are who, who you decide to be. You are, as cliche as, you, as it may sound, you, know, you are the captain of your destiny. You are the one that decides who you are. And yes, I may always be known as the girl that was kidnapped. <laughs> Probably always will be. But that's okay, because I know that that's not all who I am. That happened to me, but I have not let that stop me from going on, getting married, having a family, um, speaking out about what's happened to me, becoming an advocate for change, becoming an advocate for women and children, and really all victims of kidnapping and sexual violence. I have not let what these two people done to me stop me. And so I'm so grateful to my mom's advice. I'm so, I will forever be grateful to the thousands of people who have prayed for me, who search for me, who have sacrificed so much on my behalf. I just want to say thank you so much for all that you have done for me over the years. And thank you so, so much for having me here tonight. It's been such a pleasure being with you. God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you.